Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this to today's event. Uh, today, we're going to look at housing cooperatives and how they can represent a sustainable model for European and Mediterranean countries. Um, my name is Alice. I work at Housing Europe, the European Federation of Social, Public, and Cooperative Housing Providers. And just to give you an idea about when we're talking about uh, what we're talking about when we hear about housing cooperatives in Europe, just within our network, we estimate that we represent about 22,000 cooperatives on the ground, managing a housing stock of over 6 million homes uh, across Europe. And um, with a, a great diversity of, of models and, and uh, type of companies involved. And um, it gets even more interesting today because we're not only focusing on Europe, but thanks to our cooperation with the Union for the Mediterranean, we're also uh, going to hear more about the cooperative models in, in other countries in the mid broader Mediterranean region and the current obstacles, but also opportunities to develop this model further. Um, I would like to thank my co-organizer, the Union for the Mediterranean. Victoria is here today, which is an intergovernmental uh, organization representing 42 countries and that it's working on encouraging uh, cooperation and exchange uh, throughout the region. Uh, so with no further ado, I would leave the floor to um, our, our first session, uh, which will be moderated by Morten Lilia, who is a, a friend and a colleague involved in Housing Europe for a very long time and is also vice director of Riksbögen, uh, which is one of the biggest housing cooperative federations in Sweden. So, Martin, if you can maybe come here. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, cooperatives, as you say, um, have a very important role at the housing market uh, in Sweden, but also in almost all the European countries. Uh, co housing cooperatives is a model that gives a lot of inclusion for the people that lives in, in, the, in the houses. One can say, uh, in short, that uh, when living and being a member of a housing cooperative, you are owner and tenant at the same time. And that gives you uh, very good um, uh, safety and also you can take part in what is happening in your, in your neighborhood and, uh, and where you live. So uh, I think co housing cooperatives has a lot to contribute in the development of our societies. And uh, therefore, I, I look really forward to this uh, conversation and presentations about examples from different countries, um, from Germany and from uh, Ireland. And then there is supposed to be someone from uh, Italy as well, Rosanna from Italy. Uh, but um, uh, first, I will give the floor to Guidi Schwarzendahl from GDV. GDW in uh, Germany. Um, you are welcome. Do we? Okay. Wonderful. Uh, oh, there's already my presentation. And uh, you, you yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hello. Hello, everybody. And uh, please decide to take a seat and uh, we will immediately start. Uh, it's about housing cooperatives. So uh, my profession or my main profession is being CEO of a housing cooperative and you already see the names and name is Bauverein and uh, I'm also working for Cooperative Housing International and I'm today here as representative from GDW. Uh, what you see here in the pictures are uh, typical buildings of our housing cooperative, which is situated in Halle in Saxony-Anhalt, former GDR. And uh, we start uh, housing cooperatives in Germany. We already heard about the number of cooperative dwellings. And uh, so uh, Germany is one of the, the big housing cooperatives countries in Europe. Uh, we have nearly 2,000 housing cooperatives. The number of dwellings is more than 2 million, so the average size is 1,000 uh, dwellings per cooperative. And you do not only see the number of employees, uh, 
but uh, also the, the timeline. So first cooperative started in Germany already in 1862. Yesterday I learned that uh, England already started in 1810, but 1862 is also very early and uh, the big boom in housing cooperatives was in Germany since 1889. And that's an, an urgent year because in these years the state decided to uh, limit the liabilities of the members of the cooperatives and uh, that was a real start for cooperatives in Germany. For example, our cooperative was founded in 1910. Following my opinion, cooperatives are up to now a non-market alternative to close the gap between availability on the housing market uh, and the demand. And why are they a non-market alternative? They are a non-market alternative because they are not interested in, in any anonymous market of people who are seeking a home, but they are interested in providing their members with homes. And so they are standing a little bit outside the typical market and they are a um, Germany non-profit market sector. What was the way to the first housing cooperatives in uh, Germany? I, I do know that every one of you uh, already had seen that, that pictures from the last century and the situation in Germany was as bad as in other states in Europe. It was a horrible housing situation, a horrible housing market. And you can see on the right side from Heinrich Zille, who is a very famous German novelist, who lived in Berlin and wrote, uh, especially for the poorer people, uh, who said, you can kill a person with an apartment just as well as with an ex. And that was the situation in the housing market. People living in the fifth or sixth backyard of Berlin, uh, mostly five, six, seven, eight persons in one room without uh, any fresh air and so on. And in this situation, uh, dedicated people decided this, that with a, a lot of small, small savings they would have the equity to start uh, with their housing cooperative and that was absolutely similar for our cooperative, this situation in the German cities. After the horrible Second World War, uh, it was the real bulk of co-op housing then in uh, Germany. You can see here uh, at the right side of the slide. That's a, a picture of my hometown, Nuremberg in Bavaria, after Second World War. That's a city center, and there was a massive lack of housing, and so all the housing cooperatives started to fill up this demand. What are the main characteristics of German housing cooperatives? Generally, German housing cooperatives are rental cooperatives. So it's a little bit like already mentioned here. Uh, uh, a status of the dwellers uh, between uh, renting and home ownership, we always say it's a felt ownership for the people who live in our cooperatives. The member has have to buy shares and the amount varies from one co-op to another and uh, it often depends from the size of the dwelling. For example, the shares for our cooperative are at an average between uh, 1,200 and 1,500 euros per flat. Uh, and although this uh, dimension of the shares depends from the actual financial situation of the cooperative, so for example, a beginner cooperative needs higher shares than an already existing cooperative. I will come back to that later. And... Uh, what is, as in, in most cooperatives, the same system. Whenever you leave the co-op, you will get back your money at the nominal value. Uh, we have such a big market of rental cooperatives uh, in Germany because we have a very regulated uh, rent system and so the rent can only increase within prescribed limits and Yes, and that's, that's also very good to know that the co-op bylaws ru rule the non-profit principle and especially the use of surpluses which, uh, or the, the use of surpluses which normally have to be reinvested in the cooperative. That's a, 
uh, task of the decision-making body in a cooperative general assembly, or if bigger, more than 1,500 members with a member representative assembly. When you want to found a cooperative in Germany, you can do that with already three persons. That's not completely the truth, because you will need two persons for the management board and three persons at a minimum for the supervisory board. Was, but with five persons, you can already uh, found a cooperative. And uh, you have to have a membership in an auditing association. And uh, they have to prove whether you have a potentially successful business case and a past examination of the auditors. That's uh, urgent because uh, we have limited liabilities, as I've already mentioned, and uh, so you have uh, to secure the members of the cooperatives with their shares and also the obligees or the creditors uh, for the cooperative and therefore you need this mandatory audit. And uh, the most urgent aspect of funding, especially a new rental cooperative, is to obtain funding and uh, also very, very urgent. And the biggest task and issue for all new cooperatives is to find a suitable plot of land uh, for the asset banking and, in addition, a share of equity. So, for example, I've already said uh, the, the size of the shares in our already existing cooperative when you will uh, fund a new uh, cooperative, we sometimes have shares up to 50,000 or 70,000 euros for a flat, and that's quite expensive. What are the conclusions of the German cooperative uh, system? The conditions for housing cooperatives in general are very good. So we have a lot of housing cooperatives and a huge building stock in these cooperatives. Uh, the well-established cooperatives are able to exist in a highly developed legal system. Uh, a problem, uh, especially for the new starter cooperatives, is a mandatory audit uh, in the uh, foundation process, because it's expensive and it needs a lot of time. Uh, and we always say we need a specific promotion program for the foundation of new housing cooperatives. GDW is here very, very helpful, especially in the mandatory audit. But what we also know is that there's unfortunately a lack of knowledge at the side of the consultants, auditors, and tax advisors about the foundation of new housing cooperatives. The situation is you uh, want to do a project in collaborative housing or whatever, and you will go to a consultant, and nearly no consultant in Germany uh, would say to you, oh, you have to found a cooperative to do so. Most of them do that in, uh, in other forms, legal forms of companies. And uh, as a result, the number of new housing cooperatives is very small compared to the number of already existing cooperatives. So that's an urgent issue and a challenge in Germany to have more new cooperatives. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you, Guido. I, I have a, a question for you already now. You just ended uh, saying that there are quite a, a lot of obstacles to create new cooperatives in Germany. Uh, can you say a few words what you think about uh, if the cooperative model is competitive enough into the future? Okay, I, I do think it's, it's very competitive. And uh, I, I'm working in, in housing cooperatives since 28 years, so perhaps I'm a little bit <laughs> the wrong person to ask that. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced. Uh, the whole time of my professional life I spend in cooperatives, and I'm absolutely a supporter of the cooperative idea, and I do think it's, it's really good. It's a little bit formal as many, many economic uh, issues in Germany. Uh, and perhaps it's, it's also very formal in, in a lot of other European countries. But uh, from the moment you will decide to found a cooperative, it will be the right way and you will have support, especially support from uh, GDW, our APEX organization, but also from the, uh, from the mm, 
regional organizations in the in the states, and uh, they will help you. But it's the the problem is I I do think we we have to do a lot of promotion for cooperatives. We had that in 2012 at the at the famous anniversary, yeah. But uh, we have to do that again and again and again. So a lot of people uh, ask me, oh, where, where do you work? Uh, it's a municipal housing company or a private housing company or what? And I always say I'm working in a cooperative. And most uh, people in Germany uh, think uh, that's that's a sort of supermarket or or what? And uh, <laughs> it's it's housing, and it's it's the best form of doing housing. Thank you, Guido. I think you were. Thank you. Into the principle number six about the cooperative principles. The principle that cooperatives help cooperatives. Yep. And now we have a voice from Italy. Yeah, yeah. Here you are. Oh, <laughs> welcome. I didn't see you uh, here Sorry. earlier. Yes, yeah. because I, but of I course. arrived just two yeah. minutes late. You just late. rushed in? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. okay. Then rush on, and okay. we can hear about uh, cooperatives in Italy. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Shall I take yeah, this one? Take. Okay. So thanks. Thanks to Housing Europe for inviting me, and it's beautiful to think this afternoon that our cooperative, historical cooperative model can be promoted in other European countries. And I just start from what Guido was saying at the very end of his speech, that we need to promote, promote, and promote. And I was thinking about the fact that this morning we have learned in the Housing Europe annual conference that there are uh, cities that are, uh, let's say, putting a challenge on the cooperative movement. For example, in Lisbon, we have heard this morning that the city of, of Lisbon has decided uh, to do new affordable housing uh, for young people with the cooperative model. Barcelona is working a lot on these 1,000 new uh, affordable housing with the cooperative model. So I think that uh, I was saying to also Alice Pitini in Housing Europe that there is it is as if uh, we can think about of a sort of nouvelle vague of the housing cooperative movement. So I will just say something about how uh, housing cooperatives work in Italy. Let's see if it works. Yes. So um, I represent uh, Lega Coop Abitanti, which is a national association of, of housing cooperatives in Italy. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the first housing cooperative in Italy was created at the end of the 19th century. So, uh, for example, next year, one of our cooperatives in Milan will uh, have 120 years. So we have all, all the cooperatives belonging to Lega Coop Abitanti have realized uh, in its history more than 300,000 dwellings in Italy and still uh, 40,000 uh, dwellings are undivided ownership. So meaning rental housing in a cooperative with a cooperative model as Guido has explained before. Um, so these are the basic figures. Uh, we have um, 600, more than 600 cooperatives in, uh, uh, in Lega Coop Abitanti. This is the production value, more than 300 millions, uh, the net assets. And uh, we have a lot of members, as you can see, um, 260,000 members. And we will see um, this aspect afterwards that uh, we, say, we always say that the person and the member is really at the very center of our cooperative movement. And I, I was discussing some minutes ago uh, with a colleague. Uh, yesterday, for example, um, we have participated to the Collaborative Housing Day uh, where they sometimes speak about two different models, bottom-up and uh, and uh, top-down models or self-organized housing. Uh, as Guido said, uh, we, we think that we represent a democratic way of being self-organized, but in a structured way that is durable uh, and that uh, can also have the economic force 
to give in a democratic way the, to the people uh, the possibility of uh, having ac uh, access to affordable housing. So this is a li little bit the story. As I said, uh, this is the foundation of the first cooperative. Just to give a, an idea of one um, important step we did is that in the 90s, um, we decided to change a little bit the naming uh, from uh, building cooperative to housing, to habitante, which, which means that the passage is to put the tenants at the very center of, of the projects. So from um, a project funded on, on the housing to, to a project funded on, uh, on the tenants. Uh, this is just a design of how we think now housing as a real, real welfare uh, infrastructure as the, also the European Commission is asking. And for example, my colleague this morning uh, said that one of our mantra now is really uh, to connect housing policies with, with welfare policies because we, we believe that the house is a sort of platform uh, enabling different complex services. Uh, just a few words about some issues that can be interesting uh, to, to understand how our, our model works. For example, where the, the area, do the areas come from? So it depends. In some cases, we purchase them uh, we, with our own means. And so once again, it's important to have a let's say, a, a long-lasting and a durable cooperative because you have the possibility, for example, to purchase land, which is something that in the case of self-organized people uh, and uh, um, bottom-up approaches, uh, you can do only if you have the economic possibilities. In this case, uh, the fact of being a member of a cooperative gives you the possibility that the cooperative itself uh, purchase with its own means. Or uh, then we will see in other cases, but it, it is always more rare uh, at present, at least. Uh, we have the assignment of public areas either with payment of charges or with compensation. Uh, so uh, one of the questions was how is the price fixed? Again, it depends. We have, let's say, three different kind of of tenors, we have ownership. So uh, Guido was saying that they, they have mainly rental housing. I must say that uh, we have the two kinds of, um, of tenor, uh, more, I would say 50-50, ownership and uh, undivided ownership. Um, so it depends. Um, so we have 20% cost of area, 60% the cost of construction, and then we have general uh, costs. So in, in the private market, uh, the, the price is fixed, is, is, is set autom uh, autonomously by the cooperative. Uh, of course, on the other side, on, on the contrary, in contracted and subsidized building projects, it, uh, it, is, it has usually a predefined uh, value. Um, undivided uh, ownership, uh, it's the same principle. Uh, so these two possible, um, let's say, version, either if you are on the private market or if you have a subsidized uh, building project. But in this case, the difference is that uh, the rental fee uh, covers a portion or even all of the cost of the cooperative's debt necessary to cover uh, the cost for a certain number of years, which is uh, around generally around uh, 15 or 30 years. And then we have, uh, um, let's say, uh, a more classic <laughs> Uh, model of rental housing, which is not undivided ownership. And, and again, the price, it depends. Agreed rent, if you have contributions, and again, uh, if you have subsidized rent, you have some, uh, some limits. And if you are on the market, there are no limits. Um, one question that can be interesting for those who want to promote a new cooperatives, uh, who, who provides the mortgages, 
so the loans are mainly provided by, by banks. Uh, we have also um, uh, the system of that it's still in use, and, and which is an important resource, resource for the cooperatives, uh, the, the social lending, meaning uh, members who put economic resources in the cooperative itself. So we have to do two funding resources. Um, how are members selected? Uh, we have uh, no particular limits in selecting uh, the members. This is a very important principle, I think, uh, we, um, we, which is called in the cooperative movement the, the principle of the open doors. Uh, um, so again, the democracy. And uh, then, for example, in the case we have specific projects targeted either for senior housing or for uh, young people. In that case, we can have some criteria for choosing, but no criteria for entering in the cooperative itself. Um, to, to, to finish my presentation, um, very, very briefly, um, I was um, thinking about uh, the difference um, that which is quite relevant, that, that there is in the role of, of public administration uh, at the beginning, at the startup of the cooperative mo housing movement in Italy. Uh, so public administration and welfare states and, uh, and uh, let's say public resources has given up, has given us, uh, sorry, grants, financial contributions, uh, contribution to cover financial charges, um, or very important, we discussed it this morning, uh, building areas and tax incentives, which is more rare at present. Uh, uh, in Europe, we are discussing a lot about this. It is um, more and more difficult to have areas from the public administrations to have grants. Uh, fortunately, now there are some European funds that are, in a way, uh, used by uh, regions and municipalities that can be uh, also of some utility for cooperative for the cooper housing cooperatives. But we have to struggle, as Guido said before me, uh, in two directions: both to promote our model, also with innovative processes of participation. Uh, uh, of people, of members, in thinking uh, new new processes and new projects on one side, and on the other side, we have to lobby and to make advocacy uh, to ask for housing policies in Europe that really uh, include and see the housing cooperatives as a um, possible interpreter of the housing policies in Europe. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rosanna, uh, for interesting and a lot of uh, lot of knowledge behind this presentation. Uh, I have a an, an question for you. Uh, if uh, one are interested in uh, an apartment in one of your rental cooperatives, how do I do? Is it just to si sign up and wait for a, for an apartment, or do I have to pay something, or what? How do how do I do? So you just have to pay a, a little charge, but it, it is really a, a sort of membership, starting membership. And I must say, unfortunately, mainly in, in big towns, you have to wait a little bit. We have waiting lists, always be because of what we were saying before, because there is a high need of, of affordable housing and no, no so much public resources to develop new housing. But in any way about your question, we are a little bit reconsidering, but we haven't done yet, the possibility to change our system and maybe uh, to ask um, to, to new members or in, in some kind of projects to, uh, to become really shareholders. With a, uh, with a bigger amount of money, but this is something that has to come. Yeah. Thank
thank you very much Thanks. once more. And now we have the third example from Ireland. A1, uh, my Swedish is not good enough to uh, <laughs> pronounce your... <laughs> Owen? Well, if that's good for you, you are welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I won't try and give a lesson on the Irish language. Uh, I'm not in any way qualified on my own. Uh, uh, ability to speak it is, is somewhat limited. Um, and I need to get the clicker. I, 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 just something that struck me from the previous presentation really was that uh, point of housing being at the center uh, I suppose of uh, the human ecosystem or the community e ecosystem and I remember once giving a, a presentation at a, a European event on the right to housing and certainly when you think about being able to access all other rights uh, including the right to enjoy life, uh, the right to health care, the right to education, the right to employment, um, having a, an address uh, maybe it doesn't matter now because we all have email addresses, but certainly uh, historically having an address, having a place to live w was crucial in terms of being able to access employment. So I, I think, yeah, yes, for me, uh, housing is, is at the centre of everything. Um, so I, I decided to focus in on a particular aspect of uh, cooperative housing in Ireland, uh, and that is the type of cooperative housing that CHI uh, is involved with, uh, with providing. And of course, somebody earlier on mentioned the importance of uh, the members, of people living in the homes as being at the centre. So uh, this was at a, a recent launch that we had. Um, in terms of, um, I, I did say I wouldn't give a lesson on the Irish language, uh, but that is one Irish word there, uh, Mel. Uh, which is this idea or this expression of um, coming together, uh, working collaboratively, uh, oftentimes in terms of uh, farm labour uh, and that reciprocal relationship that you might have with your, with your, with your neighbour. Uh, and certainly it's something, uh, whether I don't know if it's ancient, but certainly it has been around for several hundred years. Um, in terms of our own relationship with housing cooperatives, um, it probably didn't kick off until... Uh, around the 1970s really in any kind of structured way uh, and the establishment of what was then called the Nation National Association of Building Cooperatives uh, which then morphed into Cooperative Housing Ireland today. In Ireland there's about 150,000 homes provided by local authorities, by municipalities uh, and then there's about another 50,000 provided by uh, housing associations uh, of which um, we, we would see ourselves under, under that broad umbrella. Um, CHI in its history um, has developed uh, 3,000 uh, home ownership cooperatives, uh, sorry, uh, cooperative homes, um, and about 4,000 uh, rental, rental cooperatives. Uh, uh, we, are, we are the federation body, and we have 14, uh, 14 members, uh, which I'll go into more detail later as to the dynamics between it all. Historically then, uh, when I made reference to home ownership cooperatives, uh, historically the organization would have provided that expertise, both in terms of how to access finance, uh, it, the incorporation of the cooperative, um, and also uh, design and, and, and building expertise. But it was largely reliant on the local uh, municipality providing land, uh, very low cost land, uh, to the local cooperative, uh, something that isn't, isn't available uh, today. I was actually meant to click the slide, but sure that's always the way, isn't it? Uh, uh, oh, actually, no, I am on the right slide. My apologies. So from the mid-80s mid onwards, um, with the photograph here on the left is, is an example of, of one of the earlier cooperative homes, uh, uh, Shangana Heights uh, in Dublin. Um, it's still, still here today. And then, I suppose, as the organisation has grown, the photograph down the bottom right uh, is, an is a, a current development uh, that will be 208 homes. Uh, and then the, the other top, top right photograph is your, nearly your standard housing estate in Ireland, um, uh, semi-detached homes uh, with three, two, three or four bedrooms uh, would, be the, would be the common, common arrangement. I, th I think it's always important to, to look at housing I mean, what, what is the need? So Ireland has a population of in around 5 million. Um, there was reference earlier on to waiting lists. Uh, Ireland is very good at doing waiting lists, uh, and they grow. Um, so on average, for somebody to access 
a home um, either provided by a local authority or a housing association. Uh, on average, it's four, four years. Um, here it gives an indication of the various lists that we have. Um, and then also the amount of uh, uh, financial support that goes to uh, people within the private re rented sector uh, on low, low income. Um, so we know that approximately 20% of the private rented sector uh, is supported um, by, by, by uh, their rent is supported. And we also know that uh, across the whole private rented sector, about a third, uh, no, about a half um, pay more than a third of their net income. So there's a high kind of precarity really within the private rented sector in terms of affordability. Then in terms of the next slide, and I have to give uh, an organization called Self-Organized uh, Architects credit for this. Uh, I, uh, it's not unattributed, uh, but it is their work. And again, I suppose this gives a, a sense as to how cooperatives historically were, were, were developed. Um, and in many ways, some smaller cooperatives in Ireland are, are still developing um, in terms of that ideation phase uh, and then right through. Um, I would say go check out their roadmap, uh, www.soa.ie, uh, because uh, my intention was for you not to be able to read that, uh, but just to get a sense of uh, the work that has taken place in Ireland to try and uh, put down on paper. Uh, as we all know, are those involved with uh, forming anything, nothing is a linear process. Uh, however, to try and put some manners or comprehension onto something, uh, there, is, there is certainly a merit to, to linear. CHI, though, Cooperative Housing Ireland today uh, somewhat turns things on, on, on its head a little bit um, and we do it somewhat back to front. What do I mean by that is that we are at the beginning of our process is that we engage with municipalities identifying their need. Then we would bring a project along with a, a builder as a partner um, and we would present that project to the local authority or the municipality, then they would agree whether the project would go ahead. They would then be key in nominating um, the households to move into those homes, um, and the, 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 the households themselves can choose uh, whether or not they wish to, to take the home. We then link in uh, that household to what you might describe as a regional cooperative, uh, which is one of our 14 members. Then historically, um, those regional cooperatives would have had a, a strong relationship or role in, in, in terms of the management of their homes. Um, and then more so today, um, it's, it's around raising collective concerns, collective housing concerns, uh, undertaking community and cooperative activities, uh, and also being involved in, in training uh, and participative uh, opportunities for their members. What's also, I think, quite unique then is uh, of those member of those regional cooperatives, those local cooperatives, and um, they are responsible for uh, electing uh, seven of our twelve uh, national board members. And uh, so there is that that that's the hum I suppose that human cycle in terms of uh, uh, members in their homes ha having a voice, uh, uh, both in terms of how the organisation manage uh, manages and, del and delivers homes. Now. This t slide uh, will give you a sense of, again, as was how CHI as a, as a cooperative federation and also as a housing association, uh, housing body evolved uh, and where it perhaps came from. Uh, this is only perhaps some of my own uh, theorizing. But in the mid 80s, um, there was this desire to involve more actors in terms of the delivery of housing. Uh, because what was happening at a, at a public level or a public delivery of homes was that uh, it was very much in terms of level of responsibility and level of participation was down the very bottom. Um, so that there was, there perhaps might be some level of consultation, uh, but if, if very little overall. Uh, and the, the belief really then was, well, how can we bring in a, a, a model, a model that it very much has the, uh, the person living in the home at the center uh, and, and I think it's fair to say that it was that cooperative model and um, bringing that cooperative model into, um, into social housing delivery. Um, and perhaps even with the, with the objective of having a devolved management structure uh, whereby the, the, the local or regional cooperative would, would manage the homes. 
Again, and this is my final slide, um, but it takes a bit of trying to get my head around. Uh, it even takes me a bit of time to get my head around it too. Um, I think I'll make it jazzy for the next time I uh, put it up. I actually only did it during the week to try and simplify, uh, simplify matters a little bit. So CHI uh, is a cooperative of cooperatives. We're a secondary cooperative federation body. So uh, it's not that I've created this in a hierarchical way. So while the na our name's up the top, it's not in any way which uh, is something that I want to communicate. Um, so then we have, um, we have regional or local cooperatives that are here. There are uh, mem uh, members. Then we have the people uh, living in our, uh, uh, in our homes who as well, uh, uh, organizational uh, identity and cultural, cultural reasons we refer to as members also. Um, then we have ourselves then as that responsibility for, uh, for the management and delivery of the homes and have a relationship with the housing officer, that would be the person uh, uh, at the ground level. Uh, that housing officer then also has a relationship with the person living in the home. Um, and then the member living in the home has a relationship with uh, 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 at an estate level or at a, an apartment uh, or a flat uh, block level uh, in the form of a member association. Um, and then there's that local cooperative, uh, regional cooperative, which uh, the language I used earlier on. I think, I'm trying to, I've lost my count of slides. It's either, that's the last one. Oh yeah, no, the very, there is a very last one. There's always a last one and a very last one, isn't there? This is the last one. And I, it, just some hopeful messages to, to, to speak about. Certainly, I mean, we all would have heard this the last few days. Uh, it's hard to believe that we're halfway through the conference, but the importance of affordability, um, importance of security of tenure, and uh, importance of quality. And so Amanda's there on, the, uh, on your left uh, with her daughter. Um, she's uh, herself and her partner, two children. Uh, before moving into the home with us, they uh, would have experienced uh, uh, serious precarity in terms of their housing, and they had to move four times in 18 months. Uh, both were uh, both income earners. Um, and then Sean is the uh, elderly gent in the middle, um, had been living in a, a first floor uh, flat where he had to walk up and down the stairs. He, uh, he suffers from COPD, uh, and again, uh, providing that long, uh, that lifetime uh, tenancy, uh, that lifetime security. Then just in terms of the challenges uh, from ourselves, uh, I put in that point there around recognition and definitions. So what's going on in Ireland? There is a growing movement of uh, the broader movement of community-led housing, of which of course cooperatives is one particular model in that. Uh, and again, it's in its infancy and that needs to be very much uh, articulated uh, and understood. In terms of funding, um, this is always a popular topic, I think. Um, I mean, our funding arrangement at the moment, uh, I don't have enough time to fully explain. Uh, however, I think for the, the, the true uh, and, and growth of, of cooperatives in Ireland, there's, there's a revised funding arrangement required, really, uh, to, 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 further, to further advance uh, cooperatives. And then I, the, the, uh, land, access to land is always, always a typical issue. I was in awe of Helsinki, uh, uh, the city of Helsinki owning uh, about 70% of their land. The final point that I want to make, uh, which is the Affordable Housing Act, which I think has the potential to really revive that earlier iteration of housing cooperatives in Ireland, uh, because it, within primary legislation, it makes reference to, um, to the municipalities uh, being able to engage directly with, uh, well, not just cooperatives, but also community land trusts uh, in, the, in the provision of affordable homes. Um, and I think, I think it's, 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 it's our part then really to, 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 uh, to advocate uh, for that uh, and to look for both secondary legislation and policy to articulate what, what that might mean. Uh, so it's a potential for, for a very exciting, exciting time in Ireland. Um, and even just recently in February, uh, we were part of a consult public consultation on um, modernizing and reforming uh, the legislation around cooperatives because uh, uh, in many ways it's, it's archaic. Well, maybe not archaic, but it's certainly from the, the mid-1800s. Um, so there, there is real hope. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Owen. Um, actually, I have a... 
would ask for comments from you on a subject. Uh, when you are describing uh, the cooperative model of Ireland, and I have heard the same from Italy and Germany, uh, I get the feeling that cooperative, uh, housing cooperatives uh, many times do a little more than just providing homes. Uh, do you have a comment or perhaps an example of, of that, that they use the uh, housing cooperative to uh, fulfill other needs that perhaps... Uh, yeah, no, I think, I think uh, it's a very good question. Thankfully, an answer jumped into my head. Um, it's certainly CHI uh, and our, our members, the, the 14 local cooperatives, um, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity for needs and other uh, concerns to f flow up through the organization. Uh, and it, within our history, it led to the establishment of three childcare facilities. Uh, and again, providing that, that broader need um, and yeah, there's certainly, yeah. certainly is th th that, that uh, is at the mindset or, uh, of, of, of many of the cooperatives in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good keeping in mind when you are uh, talking about cooperatives. That they often, it's a base for order other activities as well, connected to a good living. Thank you very much, Owen. And perhaps I can pass that question to Rosanna or Agreed you. Do you have an example for activities that uh, uh, has been created from the cooperatives, um, not only to fulfill the need of, a, of housing? And uh, okay, so <laughs> I, I will start. Yes, yes, we 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 do. Uh, so, for example, we have a uh, member in, in our cooperative. We have uh, member meeting points because we we do think it's it's not only uh, accessible and affordable and adequate housing uh, we have to provide uh, in the cooperative, but uh, we also have to to solve the problems with with the membership uh, with the with the living together, and uh, therefore we are open not only for our cooperative members but also for for everyone in the neighborhood, because we, we think at our cooperative, we have to be connected with the neighborhood and uh, with the quarter in uh, which our homes are. And uh, that that is even more than, than living and housing, it's living together. Rosanna? Yes. Uh Absolutely yes, and and I was thinking about one of the last sentences of my Irish colleagues. Very recently, uh, we have had a very important uh, reform in the legislation. In our case, uh, the, the the last norms was about uh, was re referred to 1938, and this new legislation is saying that housing cooperatives in Italy are not only providing for housing, but also for services, and not only for members, but also for the neighborhood. So, which is very important for us. It, it happened one, one month ago. Um, and this finally recognizes um, under a, a juridic, with a juridic principle, something that we are already doing. So community building, for sure, uh, social uh, activities. Uh, but also, I, I wouldn't say uh, social or care services, but the design of these services together with our, uh, other kind of cooperatives, for example, social cooperatives. But uh, as in the design I, I showed before, the housing cooperatives really uh, can understand w which are the needs of its members and organize a little bit the process of, of care of people with other actors, which I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for interesting almost an hour. But before we end this session, I would give the opportunity if there is someone in the audience that would like to put up a subject or a question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to Helsinki. <laughs> I'm Samuel Kopperoinen here from uh, Helsinki, and I have one question for you you to ask. Uh, cooperative is a judicial model. It's uh, 
kind of model of a company or, or association. Uh, many cases and many presentation, we connect uh, the affordability to co cooperations. Uh, in Finland, we have the past five years discussed about needs of housing cooperations. And uh, in all times, there is the question that how the affordability and the judicial model of the association are connected together. What you would answer? Well, you are free in a row here, and I think you are all very good uh, persons to answer this question, or at least give a comment on it. Affordability and the cost. Affordability and, and um, uh, co the, the yeah, model. In the, yeah. um, because all ho households are not, ha do not have so much money. How do we tackle that situation? Uh, it, it, it was uh, that. Legal model. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I, now it's uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I, no, no, no. I think that in the end, the fact of uh, being non non speculative economic model, uh, which is which has been also recently recognized as a main actor of the. Uh, let's say social economy, uh, also by the European Commission, gives us the, gives us the possibility to be, um, let's say, a social enterprises with all the knowledge uh, of a structured enterprise, but at the same time uh, with the non-speculative objectives. And as I said before, uh, with the principle uh, of participation uh, at at his basis, and uh, at the same time, uh, if we uh, work as a movement also the, with the possibility of advocacy, and te to tell you the truth, in Italy we say that on average we, we are still able uh, to provide housing with a cost of 20% less uh, than the market. So this is something that demonstrates that even uh, with really low public resources, we are still able to provide uh, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I, I, I would like to add. So, uh, in the in the typical building stock, as I I said, we have uh, mainly rental cooperatives in Germany. The, the typical existing building stock there uh, is no problem with affordability due to the non-profit or very, very limited profit principle of the cooperatives in Germany. But uh, you will have a, a massive problem when uh, building new residential buildings uh, without grants, you will be not able to have an affordable rent at, an, at the end, and especially not at this actually times with uh, high prices for building products, with high prices for plots of land, and so on. That's, that's quite difficult. So there is, is, a, is a massive lack of affordability. And uh, due to this situation, for example, our cooperative is, not building, is now not building new residential buildings because it's absolutely too expensive. And what we always have to keep in mind, and that's quite difficult for us, is we are working for our internal market. We are working for the needs of our members. So in an ideal way, uh, we already have the members and the dwellers for the dwellings, and we know about their capabilities their, and their, their limitation in affordability. And so we can create the products for them, because that's our duty. We are working for our members. To uh, add a, a small point, um, and thanks for the question, Samuel. Uh, in, in, from an Irish perspective, it's what you're pointing to is perhaps hypothetical, uh, and a little bit of what Guido was saying. I mean, to build, you require access to both land and, and typically some level of uh, state support, and the, the legislation uh, would only allow for 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 affordable dwellings, and um, so. I think it's perhaps a, an academic uh, point more so than, than, a, than a point uh, uh, in reality. 
Well, thank you. And uh, I think time is closing up, but there is one more comments here. Sorry, hi. Um, I just want to ask about affordability in the Swedish cooperatives. Um, I understand the, a lot of them are full equity market rate co-ops. So how, how does the affordability work? Uh, well, you point your finger on a problem. Uh, we try to, try to handle it because the, the, the model for financing a new, new cooperative in Sweden has to be on the market. Uh, but I can say that um, um, the, the real estate itself will never go out to the market when a cooperative ha has built a, uh, on it. So what is on the market is the right to live in a certain uh, apartment. And that can be, in, in some parts of Sweden, quite expensive, in other parts, not so expensive. But when you are in such a, an apartment, you live in a cooperative and then you live in a non-for-profit organization. The problem is to get inside the door. And my organization, for example, Riksbyggen, we have special programs uh, designed for young people that they can start with renting an a, a cooperative apartment, then, then uh, when planning the economy, and after a while, be a member and buy it. Um, and I think HSB, I see behind you, uh, they have uh, also uh, programs for uh, tackling this problem in a way that, where we can open up uh, more for especially for young people. Thank you. Um, okay. There is one more question. Okay, thank you. Um, how does the uh, house, housing cooperatives in European countries that you have presented deal with the issue of migrants and social segmentation? Are housing cooperatives open for uh, migrants to join as tenants and so on, or how do you deal with this? Thank you. Uh, if I start first, uh, as we said, one of the principle, the cooperative principle, is to as uh, open membership. So um, um, we cannot put up any obstacles, and do not want to put up any obstacles for migrants or or special groups to enter a cooperative. Uh, so it's open. If you just yeah. If you have any comments? Uh, only a plug. Um, uh, CHI were involved with um, the provision of homes to Syrian refugees uh, a number of years ago, um, working in partnership with the Irish Red Cross. Um, and actually it features as part of the European Social Housing Awards uh, this evening. And you can check out a video uh, produced by BBC Storyworks. So, so I want to add it. I, I do feel that's that's our duty to do the provision also for for these people, and and these people are, in our eyes, and they are the the exact same customer than anyone else. And uh, if they are able to fulfill uh, the shares and uh, the payment of the rents, there there's no problem. And to do that in the, in the actual crisis with the refugees from Ukraine uh, in this terrible war. Uh, we have the situation in Germany that uh, social help institutions will cover the shares in the cooperative uh, as a loan and uh, they uh, will also cover the rent and so they are absolutely welcome. Just uh, another point that came to me which might be an opportunity for, for others in the cooperative movement. Um, we, we wrote to all our, our members uh, inviting them to pledge a room as well uh, and removed any barriers that there that either a perceived barrier or an actual barrier uh, to offering uh, a room to to uh, to uh, as part of the ukrainian uh, response yes I, I would add very briefly for of course open membership as my colleagues said but something more for example here if i'm not wrong there is the president of a housing cooperative called darkaza that was born really at the very beginning in the 90s to give housing to to migrants now they provide housing to any kind of nationality italians and the migrants and for example this morning we were discussing about one of the project they they manage as cooperative where 18 uh, nationalities are represented 
So their activity is not only providing housing, but also socially ma managing the complexity of living together in a community where different uh, uh, nationalities are are present and which is not, not always so easy, but very important to do in a mix uh, of tenants that we think it, it's a main ob objective. Well, thank you. Alice is looking at me now. You want to, the time is out. I think it has been a very interesting uh, conversation and discussion about uh, the corporate housing corporate's role in uh, society. And as you can hear from the panelists and so, um, a society that welcomes cooperatives also welcomes uh, a democratic view on the development and also believe that people that organize themselves can, can take care of their, uh, their problem and their future. So um, I think um, uh, it's a very good for society to promote and welcome uh, cooperatives. Thank you very much. to our uh, next panelist to, to join. Um, in the meantime, we thought of, uh, you, can, you can take a seat already, we thought of maybe understanding a bit more about the composition of this room. So uh, we would like to ask you to uh, raise a hand if you're from European countries, all of you who are here today. All right, and then I would ask those who are not from European countries to raise their hands. And EU, sorry, I, I was not specific enough. And then the next question would be, could you raise both hands if you work for a housing provider uh, kind of uh, organization? So if you provide homes yourself, yeah. And then uh, last, can you clap if you're actually house working for a housing cooperative? <laughs> So we see we have a, a lot of uh, fellow cooperators in the room who might know uh, a lot about the different systems. But for who, those who don't, we hope also the next uh, session will be very informative. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alicia, for handing over to our session. Um, our our session is composed of some representatives from the uh, non-EU countries, but that are part of the Mediterranean uh, countries. And uh, we will, uh, you, you, you will be presented with some, uh, the role of housing co-ops in uh, neighboring Mediterranean countries. And uh, this is organized, as it was mentioned in the beginning, uh, the workshop is organized by Housing Europe in cooperation with the Union for the Mediterranean. And the Union for the Mediterranean is an uh, organization established by EU to um, make this cooperation between uh, EU member states and Mediterranean countries. So uh, uh, my name is Doris Andoni. I am uh, Director of Housing Policy Department in the Ministry of Finance and Economy of Albania. At the same time, I chair the Committee on Urban Development, Housing and Land Management at UNECE, which is uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And I'll be moderating this session that is, as you see, composed by four speakers. Uh, Ms. Radmila Lajanovic, Director General of, for Housing and Legalization, Ministry of Ecology, Special Planning and Urbanism from Montenegro. Mr. Khaled Abdelhaim, Deputy Director Program Coordination, Upper Egypt Local Development Program from Egypt. Ms. Guldenhan Atai, Assistant Professor Architect in uh, uh, Mimar Sinan Fine Arts, uh, Fine Arts University, Faculty of Architecture from Istanbul, Turkey. And Mr. Hanbali Ashraf, Engineer, Chief of Services at Ministry of National Territory Planning, Housing and City Policy. So I'll give the floor to Ms. Radmila Lajanovic to start her presentation.
Thank you. Hello. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to present the situation in housing cooperatives in Montenegro. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, our uh, listening to previous presentation from EU countries, I was very impressed about the long history and the impressive numbers of the work of, of housing cooperatives. Uh, unfortunately, in Montenegro, we develop uh, housing cooperatives uh, for 10, 15 years. Uh, that is a short period for developing uh, a very serious, you know, uh, work. Uh, we passed the law uh, in 2010, law on housing cooperatives, and we start to implement some projects. Most uh, uh, a law defines housing cooperatives as a form of organization, uh, legal person, and uh, of course, person, uh, natural person, to address housing needs of its members. Accor according to the law, uh, state and local self-government self uh, may encourage the achievement of the goals of housing cooperatives through measures of social, land, credits, and fix fiscal policy. And uh, that's is the case because uh, state and local government support uh, uh, housing cooperatives in Montenegro. Uh, housing cooperatives, uh, what is very important, may operate on the principle of private-public partner partnership on the basis of contract concluded uh, in accordance with the separate law. Uh, housing cooperatives has the status of the legal ent entity in Montenegro. Uh, we have uh, so far five housing cooperatives in Montenegro. Uh, there is a housing, uh, most of these five cooperatives are uh, funded by, uh, uh, in, in separate systems, you know. Uh, most of them funded by trade union employees for uh, several systems. We have, uh, uh, oldest housing cooperative in Montenegro is uh, uh, for employees in education system, and the other is for the employees in health system, and in other system uh, which, uh, which have uh, more employees in their system. I, I, I'm talking about public systems. Uh, for previous period, uh, for 10 years, uh, this uh, uh, housing cooperative uh, uh, of the employees in the education system has built more than uh, 500 housing units for its members and uh, uh, housing cooperatives uh, uh, for the employees in the uh, uh, health system uh, built more than 300 uh, housing units which is impressive <laughs> for our, our country because we are a rather small country with the area or population. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, about finance construction of the, uh, these projects which are being implemented uh, by these housing cooperatives. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, help, you know, subsidies from the state and from local self-management. Uh, 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 the financial construction is uh, that uh, uh, local government uh, uh, stakes, uh, uh, stakes land to the housing cooperatives and the uh, 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 state subsidies some of uh, uh, some of uh, gov budget budget funding to to finish the the financial construction uh, other uh, just to, uh, yes uh, I should uh, uh, I should say uh, say about another form of, of state and municipal support in housing, uh, which is implemented through activities of Montenegrin Fund uh, for Solidarity Housing Construction, 
uh, which that fund is not uh, uh, funded according to the law of housing cooperatives, but it's very, uh, uh, his actions, his projects are very similar with housing cooperatives. Uh, the fund is a three-member company, Federation of Trade Union of Montenegro as initiator of this uh, uh, fund and the government of Montenegro and the Union of Employers of Montenegro joined and formed uh, this company with the aim to support the housing and the cit uh, for the citizen of Montenegro. Uh, the fund built more than 2,000 housing units in Montenegro uh, for, 20 year, uh, 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 for 20 years because the uh, uh, fund was founded 20 years ago. 70, uh, uh, 732 apartments in the southern region of the Montenegro, 18 uh, and 10 apartments in the central region, and uh, uh, 482 apartments in the northern. And that is impressive, maybe not for European standards, but for Montenegro standards, it's very impressive results uh, uh, for, for our country. Uh, most of housing units that were built uh, with state uh, and municipality subsidies are, no, uh, are not owned by the state, uh, and it have been purchased by the members at lower price per square meters than the market ones, and that uh, the model that is uh, 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 implemented in Montenegro. Uh, lack of financial resources, and I should say a lack of sustainable model for building housing stock that would be managed and owned by state and municipalities lead to this model of financing and supporting housing. Other reasons are tradition, I would say, population, area, and economic, political, and social circumstances in Montenegro. Such practice has caused a, lock of, a lack of uh, rental housing units in Montenegro, and now uh, at national level we have about uh, 2,100 housing units for social housing that are allo allocated uh, all uh, uh, to the most vulnerable, uh, vulnerable groups, persons with, with disabilities, single parents, members of Roma population, and uh, other beneficiaries in social need. In order to improve the social housing system, various models of forming a national housing fund are being considered with the aim to increase the number of uh, social housing units. Thank you very much. Thank you, Red Mille. Um, we saw, as you can notice, it's a, a different model from what we have previously seen. If I understand well, so you have a legal framework. Why? You have a legal framework completed. And you also provide financial support through the state budget. Uh, the cooperatives looks like closed uh, to their members. So it's not the same as it is in, uh, in the previous uh, presentations that they are open. Is it right? So they uh, are closed. And who decides who has to enter into these uh, houses and who, uh, how the um, uh, can join. Yeah, uh, I understand. Uh, who uh, that? Uh, because uh, uh, according to the law, uh, everybody can join the the housing cooperative. But uh, uh, as uh, the founders are trade unions of uh, employees in some uh, different systems, uh, uh, I I don't have interest to join the housing cooperatives of the members of the trade union of employees in uh, education, you know. Uh, it's not uh, because uh, they're uh, all uh, in, in that system for employees in education, for employees in a health system. And that is, uh, uh, I think, that not very good solution, you know. I think we should, uh, we should promote for uh, uh, more people to join 
uh, to become a member, not only for only one, uh, you know, employees for trade union, but to be wider, to be wider, you know, with the, with with the member of the uh, housing cooperatives. And are there requirements? Are there requirements for income limits, or it is open for the members of that category, like um, education or health? No, no requi uh, requirements of the income. Only members of the of that group, employees, you know, employees in health system, employees in a uh, lot of, you know, uh, um, uh, health system consists of the many uh, institutions, you know, yeah. in Montenegro and I, I assume everywhere. Okay, and uh, regarding the, uh, the the cost, so what this pay for, for having the, the apartment, how it is compared with the market? Uh, most uh, the cost uh, when they buy uh, the apartment that uh, housing cooperative builds, it's uh, uh, more uh, about 30% cheaper, cheaper, lower than, uh, than uh, uh, the price uh, or market price of that uh, real estate, that flat. Well, okay, for me, we, we can continue later on with a question from the audience, but now we, we go to uh, the next speaker, Khaled Abdelheim, for showing the case from Egypt. Thank you, Doris. Uh, okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I will uh, speak about housing cooperatives in Egypt, and I named my presentation as the underused potential. I'll share with you why this particular thought. Um, housing cooperative movement in Egypt is uh, really old. It extended uh, since the early 19th, uh, 1900s um, in five sectors. So housing was one, but it's also in agriculture, fishery, consumption of goods and, and production. And uh, so we have a long uh, history of uh, cooperative movement. And um, the housing cooperatives emerged in the 1930s. Um, and especially in 1954, the Housing and Construction uh, Public Agency was established. That was right after the 1952 revolution. And if you know a bit of history of Egypt, you will know that in 1952, we had a socialist regime uh, of Abdel Nasser regime that extended on, uh, from the 50s until the early 70s. And at that time, the uh, cooperative movement was much encouraged uh, under the uh, socialist regime. Um, in the, uh, and by that time, in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, uh, there were already existing 21 housing cooperatives. 1981, we had the housing cooperatives law being issued, and uh, this housing construction public agency was made specific to cooperatives and renamed supporting and given the role to support housing cooperatives and unions. So we have housing cooperatives, but we also have unions of housing cooperatives, either uh, region, uh, regionally in each uh, governorate and so on. Uh, the government supported uh, housing cooperatives, uh, including low interest loans, so giving loans on a longer period of years, 15, 20, 30 years, with uh, a much lower interest rate than the market price, and also access to land uh, in new cities uh, that can be like 25% cheaper than normal offering of land. Um, number of issues here. Um, issue number one is about the performance of housing cooperatives. Very simply, the problem is the housing cooperatives, they, they play the role of housing developers. So once the construction is being done or the land is being offered, then the cooperative is no, no longer active. It, does not it is not dissolved, but it is not active. So membership here is not very active. And this is so the internal governance 
of housing cooperatives is a real issue. Even during construction or during land subdivision, members are not very engaged. There is only the it's a housing cooperative is formed with a board of directors, and then there is an executive management, um, and then there is the general assembly of members. Usually, the general assembly does not take much interest in following up what is happening and so on. And that creates a room, I would say, for mismanagement and sometimes for corruption that has been uh, forced the government to move to another, the other second issue that I will come to. But here, there are issues of good governance, the lack of good governance, accountability uh, of management and so on. Um, and the lack of a role for the management of common facilities like infrastructure and services and so on. And here, municipalities do not usually step in. Once there is a real uh, um, housing state that is established by a housing cooperative, the municipality imagines that the cooperative will manage everything inside, and the cooperative is waiting for the municipality to come in and pave the road, do street lighting, and collect garbage and so on. And there is a gap between the two rules. Um, so, another issue also related to uh, management is that once the housing project is done, the members can form what is called union of occupiers. And the union of occupiers encompass those who are renting and those who are owning. And there is a law now organizing the union of occupiers that give them um, legal status to collect fees for water charges, for um, services, and so on. And then comes this competition between the union of occupiers and the housing cooperative, who should manage, who should control resources, and so on. And that creates more complexity. The images I'm showing is for one famous housing cooperative. It's huge. It built um, a big number of hou housing uh, units but also have an issue of not completing the housing units uh, with problems of uh, funding and so on. The issue number two is about beneficiaries and the eligibility for subsidies. Who forms housing cooperatives in Egypt? Actually, most housing cooperatives are formed by professionals associations, like the syndicates or the employees unions, like in Montenegro. Um, or by middle and high income groups. Those are the ones who are able to organize and have a legal entity and go through the organizational aspects of forming uh, a cooperative. Um, this is one issue. The other issue about eligibility and accessibility is actually if you have, if you get a housing cooperative unit or a flat or land, you, you, get, you are responsible for repaying the subsidized loan to the government. And to do that, you have to have guarantee, credit guarantee that secures your payment. So if you are a government employee, that is okay, that secures that you will pay it. Otherwise, you have to have some assets. And for lower income groups, especially those who are working in the informal economy, they cannot do that. Which means that by default, the housing cooperative um, option is not available for the lower income groups, those who are working in uh, the informal markets. Um, so that means also a little bit of miss, missing the target. Uh, originally, housing cooperative movement was supposed to help those in most need of housing to get access to the housing market because they cannot afford market a real, a real estate market. So. If, they are, if, if this is happening, then they are actually, it is not fulfilling its target. And in an analysis of the demand for housing that I have done several years ago, I have found out that you, you can say that 75% of the urban population or of the population are in different categories of, urban, of housing needs. So it is not only the very poor, uh, the, the poverty line, urban poverty line is like 45% of the of the uh, population are under the poverty line. And I have added to that to say that the housing poverty line is actually including 75% of the population. 
But so which means that those who are middle income are also struggling to get access to housing. And the housing cooperative is a good solution for them. Huh? So that means that the efforts are not going in vain, but it means that it is not capturing very important big segment of the population to get access to housing. The third issue is about informal housing. So the underused potential of the cooperative housing sector. For you to know, um, we have what is called informal settlements or informal housing. Housing that is built uh, not um, in line with the planning regulations and the building regulations, and sometimes on land that is not designated for housing. And this is not like small portion. 60% of housing units or housing areas in big cities like Cairo are informal. So it's a big phenomenon, it's not exceptional. And if we calculate the population of greater Cairo region, like 18 million, so you can say like 10 million of them live in informal housing, okay? Um, these low-income families, low to middle-income families, do not uh, have access to formal housing. So the housing cooperative sector, so what did it produce? The housing cooperative sector up till now has produced 1.4 million housing units in all cities. Impressive by number, but just also for you to know that in Egypt we, are, we have crossed the threshold of 100 million uh, population. So our population has, has gone above 100 million, so we're a lot of people there. Um, 1.4 million housing units is remarkable, but it has nothing in relation to the demand for housing. So supposedly, I imagine that housing cooperatives could have provided the alternative to informal housing, but it didn't. So this is what I call the underused potential. Housing cooperative is a very good potential because it organizes people towards housing with a lower cost than the market, but accessibility of those who are lower income is problematic, so uh, the need um, to facilitate formation, the formation of housing cooperatives and provide technical support, but also facilitate access to low-income people to cooperative loans. Maybe the terms and conditions of offering these loans needs to change, especially that people are organized in a cooperative, and we can use something like sort of um, shared uh, risk when you talk about loan um, repayment or something like this. So this is, um, in a nutshell, the, um, the story of housing cooperatives in Egypt. And um, yes, one last thing that is also remarkable. The, so we had, at the one stage, housing cooperatives only subdividing land and offering them land parcels to the members, and the members will construct their houses. So that was one option. The other option is that the housing cooperative constructs housing projects and then the members are allocated housing units. Now what has happened since 1981 that the housing cooperative and construction agency started to build housing projects, replacing the role of housing cooperatives and they offer the housing units directly, they make calls, huh, public calls, and people can apply and get a housing unit and from the agency, the, the government agency, directly. Uh, what, what is remaining cooperative is the, housing, was the housing loan. So it's a housing cooperative loan, but there is no cooperative. <laughs> the housing cooperative as an organization, and that shows actually what I call also the provision-based approach. The government steps in, okay, if people, especially of lower income groups, are not able to organize themselves, uh, we will do this role. So instead of encouraging more cooperatives to be formed, they are playing the role of the cooperative and they're constructing housing uh, projects and offering housing units to, uh, the members, to the members. So here I stop, thank you. Well, 
thank you, Khaled. It was a, a, a different picture that we got from, from Egypt, and I think that um, perhaps the challenges that were presented in the first session are nothing compared to what um, the cooperative sector is facing in, in Egypt. But w what do you think, how, um, what can be a solution? Uh, how do you think that co housing cooperative can have a future in, in Egypt? Uh, yes, definitely it can, it can have a future, but we need to work on a number of issues from the government side and from the people side. From the people side, we need to enhance the um, community-based organization and association spirit more, uh, so people are more confident to organize and towards uh, the purpose of housing. And, and also to uh, give uh, skills, to build the skills of those who form housing cooperatives so that we can find successful examples. From the side of government, the government also needs, instead of replacing the role of co co housing cooperatives, is to encourage the formation of more housing cooperatives. Like everybody else and also in Italy and Europe, the willingness of government to continue um, Support to cooperatives is getting less, and especially in uh, giving accessibility to land. So here, government policies needs, if they are serious about solving a big portion of the housing problem, is to help housing cooperatives continue to have access to land in good locations uh, and, and also access to uh, infrastructure and to loans. Yeah, thank you. We will have time. I hope that we can leave some time for questions and discussion at the end because it's a very interesting topic. Now I give the floor to Ms. Guldehan Atay from Turkey. Thank you, Doris. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for your introduction, Doris, and uh, thank you to all, especially the organization team uh, in Helsinki and the committee for this festival, which gives us the opportunity uh, to have discussions on creating sustainable environments uh, dominated by cooperative housing policies. As an academician, uh, my field of study is uh, um, focused on the sustainable environments by the means of the user-oriented uh, housing projects, uh, as mentioned uh, by the pre previous uh, session. So the housing uh, cooperatives is one of the main issues of my works. Let's, what, this, this one. Uh, so in my presentation, I will bring your attention to cooperative housing in Turkey in the context of breaking points uh, in history and uh, promising uh, aspects. By, uh, by the means of cultural and physical uh, sustainability. And uh, generally in my uh, studies, I aim to create a discussion around these kind of questions, like when cooperative housing system stands out in terms of architectural production in Turkey, when it seems to be blocked in terms of social, economical and political aspects, and uh, which criteria, uh, by some successful uh, examples, can be as exemplary uh, for the new approaches in terms of housing uh, cooperatives, how the relationship of the actors can be established in good manner uh, to create user-oriented systems. So, I will be emphasizing uh, some qualifications of the projects instead of given the quantitative uh, ratios, but of course I will. Uh, so, so uh, we have to uh, create the solutions on these kind of economical and social and political aspects uh, as well. Um, well, in Turkey, the historical trajectory of cooperative movement beginning in 1930s, uh, the state has played a, uh, when the state has played a significant role in development 
uh, of the cooperatives and uh, the financial regulations were really powerful after the establishment of the Republic by 1930s. Uh, in the housing cooperatives of Turkey, after the Republic, in line with Atatürk's request, uh, the establishment of the Turkish Cooperative Society coincides with the date of 1931. Uh, and uh, this is the first um, uh, cooperative work, uh, which can be accepted as uh, a cooperative system in Turkey, uh, established in Ankara and uh, in 1934 by high-income public officials around an approach of settlement, which can be evaluated as a sample of garden city implementation in Turkey. Uh, it is designed by, by Hermann Janssen, who was one of the architects and planner migrated from Berlin in 1930s. Uh, he was in charge of preparing Ankara zoning plan in the second half of the 1930s as well. So, uh, so the housing uh, practices uh, and credit support for their employees are also uh, among the important uh, factors in the development of cooperatives by those years. And it was well uh, supported. And supporting cooperative housing production with public resources strengthens the discourse uh, that the uh, system has been dominant in cooperative organization uh, since the beginning. Despite the approaches in favor of single houses in the uh, 90s and 70s, uh, the housing cooperatives, which were built uh, in the form of apartment blocks, started to spread rapidly since uh, 1950s as well. Uh, Love on cooperatives, which is uh, which reorganized uh, uh, in 1969, enabled uh, enabled uh, private sector uh, investors uh, who bought land on the periphery uh, of the city as well. So. Uh, you are uh, weaving the data uh, that is uh, concerned about the uh, numerical uh, data, uh, as you see, uh, between the 70s and 80s, uh, there are uh, a, a different um, uh, increasing uh, in the numbers of the cooperative uh, production, but uh, after 80s, you see uh, it's very uh, different from the others. Uh, so, uh, this is related with some leg legislation in this kind of uh, productions, in this uh, cooperative productions. And uh, also, this is very important, uh, uh, very uh, important um, implementation uh, by the sort of the qualification. I mean, uh, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, the qualification is very high, but after a while, uh, the quantitative, uh, is, uh, quantitative production is increasing, but uh, we cannot mention the qualification so well uh, by the means of the uh, incomers. Uh, after 80s, as uh, my colleague Hallett uh, mentioned uh, in the previous uh, presentation, the um, income groups are changed a little bit by the cooperative system. So the high income groups can be entered uh, in the game, and uh, so the production uh, differs uh, so, di um, so increasingly, increasing uh, so numerically. Uh, I will show you some cases, uh, successful cases, uh, with this concern. Uh, this is uh, Chorum Binevlar. Uh, this is an, ex is an example of these works. Uh, it is also can be evaluated as successful implementation by the means of a housing cooperative and that adopts a participatory production process. Uh, the most important role of uh, this project was to aim for the development of this region, which is located in the periphery of Chorum, not only in terms of physical environment, but also in terms of socio-economic aspects. Uh, architects were aim, aimed, uh, architects' aim was to build uh, houses for people by not uh, diving this beautiful nature into parcels with known lines, 
uh, but also developed the region uh, just uh, by economically and to create a sustainable uh, cultural and physical aspects. Um. So you can he easily uh, observe uh, here uh, the types of dwellings related to the uh, lifestyle. No, no, sorry. It, it little bit changed uh, with uh, the lifestyle that formed by meeting with the families by means of various uh, services and meetings as well. Uh, the created processing system uh, includes all actors contributing to production and the project design processes and also creates various discussion platforms in this direction. The mentioned di discussion platforms are very important to understand the tendencies uh, of the people in the region, which is mostly related for the physical and cultural continuity. And uh, this methodology can be affiliated with the projects in Matteotti village by Giancarlo De Carlo, uh, and also uh, with the Nib Gurna uh, in uh, Egypt. Uh, by Hassan Fethi. So the diversification of housing units according to l income groups is included in the project design process as one of the important conclusions drawn from uh, the results of this service uh, and meetings. So you can easily see the charts of uh, some sharing uh, labors uh, by the process. So these labors uh, can create a, a cultural and economical uh, sustainability for this environment. And uh, we can easily say concern that the architects were in effort to create population to be employed with also during the construction process of the project. And uh, also after, it's shortened, after a while, uh, they do something on it. Uh, and the financing uh, opportunities in uh, cooperative housing production after uh, 80s have been decisive role in housing cooperative organization as well. Uh, so uh, I will show another uh, uh, example just to summarize uh, what Toki does. Uh, does. Uh, as mentioned, um, uh, Toki is a public institution affiliated to the Ministry of Environment Organization of Turkey, uh, established especially for the production of social housing. Uh, but uh, also uh, held, uh, has implemented, uh, has uh, emphasized um, Toki also uh, uh, doing uh, some uh, social housing instead of uh, producing uh, cooperative housing by now. So uh, you can see uh, uh, the quality of the, these kind of uh, urban regeneration. Uh, this is in high quality and have some social donations with it. So people prefer to... Uh, just to uh, enter this kind of social housing projects in, instead of uh, being a, uh, being a, a participated in different kind of cooperative houses. So, uh, despite all difficult conditions, successful examples of housing cooperatives can still be found in small cities and uh, with the effects of the earthquake. So, this is a, a high... Uh, quality uh, for the cooperative uh, and um, in 1999 the earth earthquake in Düzce, uh, after the earthquake in Düzce, the all uh, participants uh, all the tenants uh, of the owners of the houses uh, come together and to uh, gain a group uh, so uh, they it was founded by those who come came together around the model of solving problems by acting together so this example called Düzce Mutevleri defined as a housing cooperation which began as a civil initiative and turned into an United Nations Habitat Hours winning housing project. Uh, so, uh, for, so we have uh, these kind of projects in different kind of small cities uh, after the earthquake, but uh, it is uh, improving, uh, it, it is um, searching to be improved. Uh, in different kinds of uh, cities as well. 
so this is a good uh, example. And uh, for any cooperative system, we need to search on the parameters of if uh, uh, to have a discussion on. Uh, so we have to, um, we are realizing we have to redefine the actors. So we have to emphasize the user participated systems uh, and financing is another aspect to define a system uh, that considers uh, labor opportunities and creating new ur urban facilities. Uh, so for the user, uh, we have to define a new role uh, that uh, once uh, it was a maker and then user and then participator. And then again, it must be maker maybe. We are now um, studying on a project uh, that is uh, supported by EU just to uh, have some implementations in different uh, regions of the Turkey. And also uh, to define a new cooperative system, we need to search on user-centered systems and the main points of housing cooperatives uh, are these ones. And uh, for a lyric <laughs> final, uh, with Bruegel and Lefebvre, uh, for, uh, thank you for this uh, uh, discussions uh, in a festival uh, roof. Thank you. Sorry, it was a long a bit. Thank you and sorry for Apologize. interrupting you because we are running out of time. I didn't notice that because the time flew so fast and uh, we don't have so much time now. But I invite now uh, Ashraf from uh, Morocco to bring uh, another perspective of uh, housing cooperatives in, in his country. So please. Uh, thank you, Doris, for your introduction. Um, I'm very glad to share with you this presentation about the case in Morocco and to debate also about uh, the success uh, factors uh, and, of course, uh, how can they be replicated in our countries, uh, taking into consideration, of course, the, the housing development uh, context in our countries. So, my presentation, uh, as the definition, I will, I will be so... Uh, I'll be so quick, okay? So, for in Morocco, for a cooperative to be recognized as a housing cooperative, the main activity of the cooperative must be the construction of collective and individual buildings. Concerning the, the, the rental model, we don't have this type of model, so all these buildings are for sale. They must be intended for the accommodation of the members of the cooperative, as well as all the other members who will join, of course, later. The housing cooperatives formula in Morocco occupies the church place after the agriculture cooperatives and craft, craftsmanship in terms of number of, of units. And today, more than 55,000 Moroccans have joined approximately 1,300 uh, cooperatives and invest more than 50, 500 million euro. Uh, the choice of uh, the uh, cooperatives formula offers several advantages, including uh, the promotion of solidarity, of course, when you are allowing to a group of people to, to, uh, to come together and to realize uh, uh, what a single individual cannot do by itself. Second thing, which is our, uh, very important, is the promotion of tranquility. And uh, when you are choosing your future, uh, uh, co-owners, of course, and this is only available when you have a, a small cooperative or at, at least middle cooperative for the, 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 uh, the big cooperatives. Uh, so you are calling for membership, so you can only uh, pray God to have uh, good neighbors, okay? So uh, the third, the third uh, uh, important advantage is the economizing, of course, and w when you uh, uh, take um, uh, a cooperative example, for, for the medium of the cooperatives in Morocco, you are reducing the cost of production, estimated generally something between 20 at uh, 30 percent compared to the uh, market price. And this uh, reduction of uh, the production is uh, due thanks to two major factors. The first one is the economy 
of the intermediation costs of the real estate professionals. And the second one is by the existence of an advantageous tax regime in Morocco. For a housing cooperative uh, 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 to be, uh, uh, to, to, uh, in order to, uh, to exercise legally, she must, ha she must uh, uh, or she have to go through several stages and which I will quote here the main stages. So, so the first thing maybe is to give her name. And the name of the cooperatives must be validated by the Office of the Development of Cooperation in Morocco. And second thing, you must organize a constituent assembly, which bring together all the founding members. Of course, uh, later members can join later. The third thing is the signature of the statutes by all the founding members of their representatives. And the fourth thing is the registration of the cooperative in the local register of cooperative, which is managed by the court in, of first instance in Morocco. We have the, uh, the national register of cooperative, which is held by the Office of Development of Cooperation. And the five thing is that the deposit of the funds of the uh, members, so their contribution in a bank account with the name of the cooperative. So uh, to, to, for a cooperative as, uh, to be uh, available or to, to uh, exercise legally, she must have at least five, five members uh, uh, at the time of its constitution and of course through its life. So if a member left the cooperative, he must be replaced very quickly. Uh, in Morocco, the uh, cooperatives, the housing cooperatives, takes um, advantage in, uh, in our tax regime. And I can resume, summarize these uh, advantages in three uh, main uh, exemptions. The first one is the total exemption from corporation tax. The second one is a fixed rate of registration tax. The registration tax is a tax which we pay when a transaction have uh, have been done so the buyer must pay something like 44 percent of the price of the house for cooperatives we don't have this uh, uh we are exempted in the totality of this uh, tax and we only pay something like it's a fixed rate something like uh, 20 euro and we have an exemption from social solidarity contribution this type of taxes uh, are only uh, uh, subject to the project when it's uh, a self-building, okay? So when the cooperatives build to itself, its members, she must pay uh, uh, also the uh, so social solidarity contribution, but uh, uh, we uh, uh, exempted, right now we are exempting this uh, uh, activity uh, from this tax. The advantages mentioned above are applicable to housing cooperatives respecting the following conditions. The first condition is that the member of cooperative must not be owner of a principal house. Second condition is that the members must not be part of another housing cooperative. And the third thing is that the member must assign the accommodation to his main residence for a minimum period of four years. And the fourth thing is that, that the area covered uh, must not uh, exceed uh, 300 square meters for each individual uh, uh, units. And there are no conditions on members' uh, income. So uh, uh, this is uh, the last slide. I, I want to give uh, an answer about the title of this, work, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, workshop, is what is the role of housing cooperatives so in Morocco. We are, uh, I, I mean the Ministry of Housing, we are encouraging this type of activity um, to achieve three important points. The first one is to increase decent housing for all the social classes. The second one is to fight against all forms of unhealthy lodging, as Mr. Khal said that we have uh, uh, unhealthy, so we have either this type of uh, uh, lodging by giving uh, an, an alternative for all these, those social classes. And the third uh, important point is to encourage social integration and family tranquility. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ashra, for your um, concise and uh, interesting presentation on the case of Morocco. 
Uh, we have five minutes and I'd like to open the floor for questions and comments. I see one hand there. Don. Uh, thank you all for, for the presentation. I'm one of the members of the audience, not from EU, so <laughs> I uh, sympathize with your stories and uh, understand completely the context. I come from uh, an organization which is called Mobile Housing, and uh, this is an associate, or this is actually cooperative of uh, cooperative initiatives from Central and Southeast Europe. I come from Serbia, and uh, we have started this initiative because uh, uh, there were, uh, let's say, pioneering groups that want to establish community-led cooperatives. And I am, if you are familiar with the concept, so it's a bottom-up, it's uh, people who unite together to uh, form housing under cooperative principles, uh, who would then also manage properties and not just be, uh, let's say, buying them, and they would be uh, mutual ownership, so no individual ownership. And we see this as an important shift from uh, from the concept of private ownership, because we have a lot of private ownership. 99% uh, of, of housing in Serbia, for instance, is private, and only 1% is social housing. So we really need a shift towards uh, something else. And I'm curious if you know of such examples in your own context, because we would like to connect to similar initiatives, and we are looking for, for initiatives who are going into that direction. So that's, in short, my question. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that you you heard more or less uh, what is happening in these countries and you may contact one of the or all of them uh, afterwards. But if you have any reaction, you can uh, respond immediately, briefly. That's, uh, that's an interesting uh, distinction between what you've said, community-led cooperatives and cooperatives that are formed in general for any members to join. Um, there are very, very few cases in Egypt of that sort, but uh, the reason is that, number one, people need to identify themselves as a community before establishing the housing project that they are doing, and this is usually not the case. It's, it's a case in a much smaller scale than the tens of thousands of of housing units that uh, cooperatives do later on. So we're talking about the scale of a community, which is uh, has to be small for people to identify themselves uh, as a community. And here comes an issue. Actually, I raise, I go back to your question with also raising a much um, an important issue of housing mobility. Um, it's good to be part of uh, um, a community and real estate. Uh, 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 project, but at the same time, we, people also look for mobility. So the private ownership uh, provides the opportunity of selling the unit and then moving to another place if if you have job mobility or something like this. And the problem with public housing in generally, but also in Egypt, cooperative housing that is sponsored by government or supported by government, is that it restricts housing mobility. They tell. Um, um, uh, similar to the case of Morocco, you cannot uh, leave before 10 years or something like this. So it means that it restricts the market, uh, housing market dynamics that needs to exist. And, uh, and I think it's also important not to, to restrict them. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other question or comment? Yes, Alice. Am I allowed? <laughs> I have a question um, specifically to Khaled again, but uh, it's for all uh, speakers. Um, I heard uh, yesterday um, talking uh, about uh, kind of cooperative and collaborative housing initiatives in the case of informal settlements in Brazil and Uruguay, uh, something which was really interesting. I think in the cases that you, that you mentioned and uh, to tackle such a um, widespread phenomenon. What do you think would be the added value of having a housing cooperatives instead, for instance, of the approach of a public agency just going in and delivering uh, homes? Just 
Yeah, the, the, the problem with informal housing initially is access to land, formal land, and then later on to uh, land uh, titles or land deeds and infrastructure connections and so on. And because people on an individual basis at the fringe of the city cannot do that, so they turn into informal housing. The housing cooperative can provide this bridge between individuals who are seeking uh, to have housing and access to land and between government. So in other words, the, if the government um, plans in advance uh, city extensions and offer land instead to individuals, to housing cooperatives, so people know if they organize themselves uh, and form housing cooperative, they can have access to land. Um, then I think uh, this this will bridge the uh, will solve the issue of being informal because the land will be planned, and once the planned land is offered by government, it means that they will extend infrastructure to it, and this is the most important thing. But there are of course challenges now. Land is not offered in existing cities or to the fringes. It's in new cities, and in new cities maybe not a lot of jobs are there, and the mobility and the surfaces are not as good as in existing cities. So this is why also people tend to prefer to be in, in formal housing in the existing city rather than moving to... This is changing now. New cities are catching up in terms of services and connectivity. We have changed our minds about, you know, uh, having the new cities very far from existing cities. Now we're talking about satellite communities around existing cities with 30 kilometers and with, uh, we're building a lot of public, good public transport. So going to new cities is not as frightening to people as it used to be. But it's mainly housing cooperatives can play the role, intermediary role of people who would otherwise go to informal housing and between government. Um, I, I would like to, yes. Short, a short question to Khaled. Uh, it was written in the PowerPoint that the surface of the housing units could be up to 300 square meters. Uh, well, in Spain is regulated, it has to be between 65 and 95 square meters. 300 is not a bit excessive. Okay, uh, so I would like to answer to, to the both uh, comments. F first, the f for your question, uh, Alice, I will say that uh, our approach, uh, we have a two approach of intervention in terms of, um, uh, of unhealthy lodging in general. We have the uh, direct uh, intervention, as you said, and we have many programs, many national programs in Morocco, uh, such as uh, cities without slums, uh, uh, such as the fight against uh, the habitat uh, threatening ruin, etc., etc., cetera, et cetera. and we have uh, a preventive approach by encouraging the sector private to construct social housing and by encouraging the cooperatives formula. Either we are encouraging these uh, uh, cooperatives by mainly three uh, uh, advantages: the tax advantages, the financial uh, support, and the support of lands. We are mobilizing lands for cooperatives. They asked us to give them equipped loads because they don't have uh, um, uh, the uh, financial uh, capacity to equip to equip the, the land and to construct. Either we, the the government, have uh, uh, established uh, f um, a guarantee funds in order to uh, to encourage the bank to give loans to all the social classes, including the informal activities, and uh, to in order to facilitate the access for the credit banks, and of course, in, in order to, to buy the land, to buy the loads, and its construction included. Uh, for the area, it is um, this type of, uh, of uh, uh, taxes, which is the solidarity taxes. It's for all, as I said, it's for all the self-built activity including cooperative activity. So if I, if I have a load, for example, uh, which, uh, which uh, area is 200 square meters, for example, 
I construct my loads, I will not pay this tax. So I, I said that the uh, the uh, uh, the area must not exceed 300 square meters. If it exceeds, you will only pay the tax that I mentioned. And uh, if if it is uh, uh, lower, of course, you are exempted. If it is higher, you, you will only pay the tax I have mentioned and not the, the other taxes. You will also be exempted of the other taxes and we only pay this type of taxes. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a question, Alice, for uh, you EU countries. Would these uh, tax incentives would be allowed within the um, uh, framework of uh, competition since there is not income um, criteria? It's a very good question, Doritz, and it's quite controversial. I think they could be allowed as long as they're not uh, necessarily attached to one type of business or one type of provider. So if you set criteria um, based on the size and then there, it's open and in competition for everybody to, to, to do the job, basically, then I think it should be okay. But if you necessarily attach it to one type of uh, um, company or, uh, or status, let's say, could be controversial, but I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, any, any further question or any comment, like, for example, from the previous speakers of the first uh, session? No, do you see any uh, where any merging or uh, similarities and um, differences between um, systems in Western countries and uh, Mediterranean countries. So I'm. It's, it's, it's really difficult to answer to this question, but it's a very good question indeed. Uh, I do think it's, an, it's a very, very huge uh, challenge, uh, especially what we, what we heard uh, from, from Egypt and the situation with the informal settlements. And uh, so um, my first conclusion would be we, we have to rethink again uh, in or, or we, we, we should try to rethink again and without any uh, borders and out of the box how we can solve the problem with the plots of land. And uh, that, that is always that's, that's, uh, the red fathom you, you will find everywhere. It's, it's always the same discussion. So sometimes we, we discuss finance, but to be honest, it's not only finance. It's in the first thing we are missing and, and what, what is the big problem is the restricted... Uh, some of uh, plots of land and uh, the accessibility to to land and the right to build on the land and that is yeah that's a, it's a, a huge challenge especially in in a country like Egypt with such a big population and a still growing population very fast and that's it's very similar to Turkey and uh, I presume also to Morocco yeah yeah thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, yes, please. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. I just want to uh, say that I have learned a lot from the presentations of the European cases. Just to know that the housing cooperative movement is still alive in, in Europe, it seems that it's still intact with its, the basis uh, and the motivations of the cooperative movement in general. But I also found out that what we share with them, that we all need to recreate the, uh, the, the, the corporate image um, uh, of housing cooperatives globally, actually. So this is something that we share, especially with the rise of the private sector-led uh, development and the capitalism and so on in all our countries. Uh, housing cooperative is something that still needs to be well promoted. We need social marketing for this concept in our countries. And this is something that we share together. Maybe it can be um, an area of collaboration of how generally to market again to the people and to the governments uh, 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 cooperative housing. This is maybe the issues that we have to deal with can be different. 
like in in Egypt, in uh, Morocco, and in, in our in other countries, and uh, different from Europe. But again, the what is lacking is that we push for this and to keep this uh, um, approach uh, towards housing uh, alive and with some innovation and uh, also of the style of housing itself and so on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And in particular, in this uh, situation where when the uh, affordability or access to affordable housing has become a um, tremendous issue uh, for, um, you, you said that 75% of the population falls under the um, almost poverty, housing poverty line. Um, and I, I believe that this is more or less a situation also in other countries because nowadays not only the low income, the classical uh, groups of society, low income, are um, housing poor, but also uh, middle income are becoming housing poor because of uh, this big difference between the houses prices in the market and the a flatting um, uh, in, uh, level of income, which is not rising at the same pace with um, with um, housing prices. So, with this, I would like to thank all the speakers. Thank you very much for your contribution. And um, closing this session, I will give the floor to um, Victoria. Well, I will just say a few words to close the session, so don't, don't panic. Thank you, all of you, for coming all the way uh, along from your countries uh, here. And thank you also to uh, Alite on behalf of the Union for the Mediterranean for giving us the opportunity to share uh, these EU and non-EU cases, which is basically the objective of our organization, as, as it has uh, previously been said. Uh, it's a uh, Huge topic. This is just a first step, but well, it was uh, for us. It was very useful because we were not aware that there were housing cooperatives in Egypt, that there were housing cooperatives in Morocco, that uh, housing cooperatives existed in Turkey since uh, 100 years ago. So it has been very, very interesting for for me, and uh, I, I guess that for for many others as well. So thank you, everybody, for being here today.